right. Well, I'm Andrea Herr. I am a Pima County Master Naturalist from Cohort 3, and um, the Pima County chapter of the Arizona Nat Master Naturalist is thrilled to welcome Jeff Babson. Um, many of you know Jeff. He is the Wildlife Viewing Program Specialist for Pima County Department of Natural Resources, Parks, and Recreation, and he is also an instructor for the Arizona Master Naturalist Program. So this is a series of planned webinars and the Arizona Master Naturalists are, plan are putting together great content to help further our mission of education, conservation, and citizen science during these challenging times. So if you haven't already, please sign up for updates via Eventbrite and uh, you'll get notification of all the good stuff we've got planned. We will be watching the chat for questions, so feel feel free to submit your questions or observations, and we'll do our best to fit them in. And um, with that, I'll turn the rem remainder of our time over to Jeff. So take it away, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Um, thank you, everybody, for for joining us um, for joining us this evening. Um, many of you may have never have thought you were going to be somewhere to learn about moths. So uh, I'm glad you're here. We're glad you're here. And I am going to go ahead and share my uh, screen now as I'm already sharing it. I'm gonna start the, uh, the program, but there's a question from Greg um, uh, about is the new moon the optimal light trapping date? And uh, th th yes, basically, um, it de obviously depends on the time of year. Um, new moons in January are not nearly as productive as new moons in August. Um, and there's other factors as well, uh, humidity, um, things like that. But if you can get a new moon during, the, when, when you get, not if, when you get a new moon during the monsoon season, that's a really good time. Um, it's uh, the new moon, a lot of the predators that would be um, uh, finding moss without too much difficulty, they have a harder time because there's no, no light from the moon. Also, uh, warm temperatures and humidity are both ideal for um, uh, you know moths to be attracted to lights that you put out. But um, so those are the those are really good nights. It doesn't mean that any other night's not as good. Uh, but there is definitely a decline in activity. If you wanted to do it for the very first time on a full moon night, you might be a little bit disappointed because the moths um, tend to stay hunkered down a bit more on on full moon nights. All right, so um, let's get this thing started. So um, moths, um, moths are really um, awesome, I think. Uh, if you like butterflies, you're gonna really like moths because there's a lot more of them. So what we're basically going to do over the next hour or so is kind of run through some basics. Um, I'm not gonna show you photos of many of the small brown moths or small black moths because my purpose in doing this is to inform you, but also get you um, enthused about moss. And I sure if I showed you a lot of brown moss pretty quickly, the enthusiasm would, would go away. So uh, we're going to do that again. Thank you for the Arizona Master Naturalist for asking me to participate. Um, this is a, a moth that's actually fairly common up in the um, up in the mountains. Um, usually around oak woodlands, so sort of middle elevations. Uh, a lot of moss, the problem for a lot of people with moss is many of them do not have common names. So it kind of forces them to get familiar either grudgingly or not with uh, the scientific names. And I hear a lot of people say, well, I can't pronounce them. Well, who cares? Um, you know, a lot of us can't pronounce them. So if you make the attempt, uh, especially if you get more into it and you're looking in you know, field guides or online and things like that. It can be a little bit intimidating, but don't let it intimidate you. Just embrace the names and, and you can come up with your own name for them too. That's perfectly fine. So um, first we need to find out um, what a moth is. That would be a good place to start. So what is a moth? Um, a moth is like a butterfly is part of the insect order Lepidoptera. Now, entomologists, and they're the, the biologists who study insects, they have divided all the insects in the world into about 30 or 33 smaller groups called orders. And the butterflies and moths together are in the order Lepidoptera, which comes from Latin words meaning scale wing. 
and that is in reference to the scales on the wings that give the um, that give the the animals their colors and patterns. They have nothing to do with flight. So if you ever, you know, sometimes you'll find like in late fall, you'll find a dead moth like in the windowsill and you pick it up and you toss it outside or whatever you do with it. And you're left with that, what, what you, looks like dust, that's the scales coming off the wings. And it's believed that, that they evolved for a couple of different reasons. Number one is so that species can recognize each other is maybe part of it. But a lot of people think they evolved for um, evading predators, specifically spiders. Um, if they get stuck in a spider's web, if they beat the rings around a little bit, they might be able to get out of the web, but leave some of their um, scales behind. And so um, that's, we don't really know. Those are both hypotheses as to what's going on. Um, Another thing that butterflies and moths share is they undergo what's called complete metamorphosis, which means there are four distinct stages in the life cycle, the egg, the larva, which we call caterpillars, the pupa, which in moth are often enclosed in silken cocoons, and then the adult, which is the thing that flies around and is attracted to your lights in the evening time. Um, they have sucking mouth parts for ingesting liquid food. So there are a couple of small families that the adults still have chewing mouth parts in the order Lepidoptera, but we're going to kind of ignore them for the rest of this class because the vast majority of them um, do not do not have chewing mouth parts. I have a straw, which is actually made up of two parts that when they when the adult emerges from the pupa, they kind of zip up, and that's what makes that tube you'll see sticking down. Um, however, many moths um, have either reduced mouth parts or they don't have any mouth parts, and so they cannot feed as adults. And so in those cases, they have to rely upon the food they ingested as caterpillars for their survival. And it also means that their adult lifespan is usually not very long, a uh, matter of days before they even, if no predator gets them, and they don't have any mouths to get nutrition into them, they might just drop out of the sky at a week old. And that's just the way it goes. I mean, that's their, um, that's their life cycle. Um, as everyone knows, hopefully most moths are nocturnal, but not all of them are. In fact, there's a fair number of moths that, I, that are diurnal. Um, and uh, many of them are brightly colored. So a question, well, let me get to this slide first. We'll get to a question of how do you separate a moth from a butterfly? in just a second. So this is one, this is again a, a fairly common moth um, that we have up in oak woodlands, pine oak woodlands, uh, you know, up in the mountains a little bit, the painted tiger moth. They belong to a group um, that are often brightly colored and they're really interesting because some of them feed on toxic plants that they can sequester the toxins inside and, and get protection from predators by having those chemicals in their body. Some other tiger moths actually make their own chemicals, including stuff like cyanide. So um, they're, they're quite capable of defending themselves and their really beautiful colors are often a warning to potential predators that you don't want to eat them because it's not going to go very well for you if you do that. So uh, again, trying to show you an, an attractive moth so that you don't think they're all brown and uh, sort of unassuming. So moth or butterfly, there are several different ways to tell moths from butterflies. Um, however, the, the argument of butterflies fly during the daytime and moths fly at night is not one of them. Um, there are a, a decent number, maybe, I don't know, percentage wise, a handful of maybe 5% of the moths will fly during the daytime. Um, on the flip side of it, very, very few butterflies fly at night. So, you know, there is that, at that end of the spectrum, it's much more clear cut than um, butterflies only fly during the daytime and moths only fly at night. So I think the easiest way to tell the two groups apart is to look at their antenna. Now on insects, the antenna acts like a, like our nose. It's basically a scent detector. They use it to find food. They use it to find mates, like with pheromones that they, uh, call with. So if it looks like a feather or a thread sticking out of the head, you're looking at a moth. So uh, the moth on the left with those big feathery antenna, it kind of looks like almost like a satellite dish for female pheromones. That's a male gypsy moth. Uh, many of you, especially if you're from 
the eastern half of North America are familiar with gypsy moths. That's the male gypsy moth. Uh, we don't have gypsy moths in Arizona, thank goodness. The moth on the right is a native species. Um, and it's, if you look sort of to right in front of the eyes and to either side, you can see the antennae sticking out. They look like a thread. The slide in the middle is a butterfly. That's a very common butterfly we have in southern Arizona called the Arizona sister. Um, and so it had, if their antenna, butterfly antenna, think of a Q-tip. It's got a thin shaft and it gets expanded near the top. Um, and so that's what, um, that's what butterfly antenna look like. Butterflies equal Q-tips, moths equal feathers or threads. Um, and that's the easiest way to tell them apart. Um, the other things are either really small and difficult to see or they're uh, much more, um, much more hard, much more, variation in them. So the antenna is a very good place to start with. So I mentioned earlier that they have, butterflies and moths have complete metamorphosis. So four distinct stages, and this is uh, an example of one of the um, sphinx moths, or also called hornworms for the caterpillars, where, and it has the full life cycle and it has the, uh, the, on the, on the outer part of the circle, it has the number of days it tends to stay in each one of the life cycles. So the females lay their eggs on the host plant typically, and they will, the eggs will hatch in about two days. It kind of depends on what the weather does. If it gets cold, for example, it can delay a little bit. Um, so the eggs uh, hatch usually within about a week or so, maybe a little bit less than that, into what we call the first instar larva. So think of instar, another word for that is sometimes stadium or I use stage better. So this is the first stage larva. And most um, moths go through, as caterpillars, go through four to six instars or four to six stages. And the key thing um, is um, that they wear their exoskeleton on the outside. So as they grow, and, and, and the caterpillar is basically a walking stomach. And we're going to talk more about caterpillars in a minute, but think of a caterpillar um, as a walking stomach. And as it's eating all that food to grow, with that exoskeleton on the outside, things get tight. And so in order to allow for further growth, they have to shed that exoskeleton in a, what we call molting or ecdysis in the fancy word. And then they, they after the molt, they have a bigger exoskeleton and allows for, for more room to grow. And then the, the process repeats itself anywhere from three to four, three to five times. And then as we, as we get to the end there, we get the, uh, the fifth instar larva, and that's the one that's going to eventually pupate. And in the sphinx moths, like this one, um, they pupate usually in the ground, and they tend to be very smooth on, uh, on, the, on the exoskeleton. And that, that loop hanging down, that's actually the, the, the proboscis or the tongue or what will become the tongue. And then it, it kind of, the, the, the wheel, the amount of time uh, with each stage is, is, is the given on this slide as what we call direct development, meaning it's not stopping, it's kind of growing all the way through. In many moths and butterflies, there'll be a stage where they go into what we call like dormancy or diapause. And that tends to be, in our area, it tends to be the winter time. And that's all of North America, not just in Arizona. You know, if you're in New York State or Montana, it's going to be the winter time because it's pretty tough for an insect to survive in those places during the winter time. Even here in southern Arizona, where we're relatively mild in winter compared to many other places, it's still the time when uh, many of the plants out there kind of grow or stop growing and go dormant themselves. And so... Um, this particular slide, it can take, you know, you know, the average, if they go straight through from egg to adult without a stopping period, it can, it can take really fast. Sometimes yeah, it can yeah. take about a month or so, but yeah, typically yeah. longer than that, six to eight weeks. And so every moth, I mean, there, every moth goes through that life cycle. Um, there are many, many species of moths out there. So there's many, many variations on the theme, but that's, they all do this. They all go from egg to larva, again, called the caterpillar, and then the pupa and the, and the adult. 
the adults, the wing one. If we, if, if someone tells you, oh, the, there's a, um, there's a moth that's, um, you know, eating my tomato plants. It's, it's not the moth doing it. It's not the adult, it's the caterpillars doing it. And so if you ever hear about a moth being a pest, it's not the adults, it's the caterpillar. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some, some caterpillars. Now this is the Carolina Sphinx. Um, so Sphinx moths are also called hawk moths. Um, their, their caterpillars are called hornworms because you can see on the bottom right, um, there is this horn-like thing that sticks out. They can't sting you. Uh, with it, it's sort of um, to make them not look like a caterpillar. To give you a, a size on this, this is probably this is about four inches long. They're they're pretty hefty, and you, and the head is to the left. By the way, he's hanging upside down. His head's to the left, um, and they will. Many caterpillars will actually hide upside down under leaves during the daytime, and that's just to keep predators like birds and lizards, especially birds from finding them. Because if you were a bird, this is a nice little snack. And so uh, the, the caterpillars don't want to get eaten. And so um, they, they then will, um, they will ha hide out and then they will hunt, or not hunt, but they'll eat during the, the evening. So the best time to look for caterpillars is to go out um, at night, actually, with a flashlight or the black light. Um, the black lights you use, if you're ever, if you're one of those people like me who goes out in your yard at night to look for scorpions, uh, they have those little black light flashlights, um, point it up into the trees too, because a lot of caterpillars have really striking patterns on them under UV light that we can't see with our eyes, but it shows up under the black light and they're really obvious during the, during the evening under a black light, but even a regular flashlight will show up, will show many of them. Um, so here's one, this is again, Carolina Sphinx. Uh, sometimes this is called the, the caterpillar, sometimes called the tobacco hornworm. Um, there's another one called the um, five spotted sphinx, which is sometimes called the tomato hornworm. The problem with those names is that the caterpillars don't know to stay on tobacco or tomato. And so um, you could get either one on either plant uh, and a whole bunch of other. The one thing that's consistent though between tobacco and tomatoes, they're both in the same, those, both of those plants are in the same family. They're in the Solanaceae, which is the um, nightshade family. So many caterpillars tend to focus on um, like a family of plants or maybe uh, a, a, you know, one genus within a group of plants. And so sometimes that's how you can um, find the caterpillar by knowing what plant that they're on. Here's another one. This is this one's just off the charts. Um, this was up. Uh, if you're in Tucson, this is up in Molino Basin, uh, the lower reaches of the of the Catalina Highway. It's on um, wild cotton, which is a native species. To give you um, a size, um, this is this could fit nicely inside of a hot dog bun. Um, that about about that's that's about how big they are. So. Um, this one, I always tell people, and you'll see a slide coming up, um, they, um, it's good to know what the caterpillar species is, if you can determine it before you touch it. And I say that because some have spines on them that can actually give us a sting. This one, it's all for show. It's also probably to make it harder for them to be ingested. I mean, if you were a a bird, I would imagine all those horns on the back of the thing of this thing would make it pretty tough going down the gullet. So um, there's that. Uh, but this thing you can actually touch and those those black sort of ovals near the near the t middle of the body. Those are spiracles. And so the spiracles are actually the entrance to the respiratory system of a caterpillar. Um, so you're basically looking sort of like a nostril there. Um, there's a question about um, why caterpillars eat leaves at their age, but switch when they're, when they're adults. And that's because caterpillars, first of all, um, caterpillars, most of them, the vast majority of them do eat leaves, but not all of them. Um, so some feed on things like fruit, some feed on fungus, like mushrooms and things like that. Uh, some feed on um, dead leaves that are on the forest floor. Uh, some are actually predators. So 
there's even though the vast majority of caterpillars do eat leaves, just know that they'll eat a lot of other things. Um, but each species tends to focus on a, on a small, uh, a relatively small menu is what they'll eat. For example, the clothes moth, where that comes in eating wool and sweaters, that's the caterpillar that just has evolved to eat animal fibers. And you can actually find clothes moths, caterpillars, and owl pellets, because the owl pellets are basically indigestible fur and other bits of their food that they just sort of regurgitate. And there's enough fur in there that actually clothes moths, caterpillars can actually um, eat enough of that to, to reach um, adulthood. So yes, caterpillars, the vast majority of them eat leaves, not all of them do, but why they eat leaves as, as caterpillars is because they have the chewing mouth parts, kind of two plates that kind of come together like this, and that's how they chew. The adults have that straw, and the straw is not adapted to feed on solid material. It's only sucking up liquids, and yet yeah, um, Greg has a really good comment. There's this there's this caterpillar in the eastern U.S. called the hickory horned devil. Um, it's similar um, similar to this guy. Usually it's, it's green. Um, and it, it's just, you can Google it after. It just, it's just a ridiculous caterpillar. It's, it's, they're really big. Um, and so it's, it's very similar, um, same genus as this one, but it just tends to be green. But yeah, they're pretty fantastic. Um, how do we... Well, if you want them, here's the thing. So if there's, there's a question about how do you get them, if I understand it correctly, how do you get them um, to um, not eat leaves without killing them? Um, the best thing you can do is pick them off by hand. Um, and then you can, um, if there's a plant like it's in your garden, you can pick them off the, your plant. And maybe if, if you have, if you know another plant in the same family that's nearby, you can put them on that. Um, uh, you can put them on, on, on the ground or over the wall if you want. But again, it's the caterpillars that are usually the issue, not the adults. But um, the citrus trees, that's usually the Western tiger swallowtail caterpillars. Kind of looks like a bird dropping. Those can't do anything to you. You can pick them up and you can just, um, if, you, if you can't stand them eating your plants, you can, take, you can do that to get rid of them. However, they turn into a huge wingspan of about four and a half inches, beautiful dark brown and yellow butterflies. So if you can let some of the caterpillars live, you'll get rewarded by these really um, uh, fantastic butterflies. And no matter what we put in our yard, I mean, if there's a plant out there, doesn't matter if it's a tomato plant or a mesquite tree, mesquite tree has several different caterpillars that feed on it. Um, if there's a plant out there, there's at least one species of caterpillar probably feeding on it. And um, I, what I always suggest is to embrace the diversity that's out there. Um, it, you know, you, if your light, your, your yard will turn into a very sterile place if you try to kill everything you don't like. Um, because our, our toxins that we use are very, um, are very efficient. Uh, at killing things, but they're not very specific, meaning they kill everything they come in contact with pretty much, including beneficial insects. Like, you know, some people like praying mantids and lace wings and things like that, that sort of do natural pest control in your garden. But if you go and spray stuff on your garden, then you're wiping those guys out too. Um, you know, I, 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 I know a lot of people who actually plant things like citrus and um, a lot of other tomato plants actually to attract the females to lay the eggs on them so the caterpillars will eat them. So it's kind of going, you know, having a garden, but kind of going in a slightly different direction. So, um, and that, I, you know, that's fantastic. If you have, if you see caterpillars or moss that you really like um, to see, like if you're looking through a book and you see this, this caterpillar or uh, moth that really captures your eye and you just say, I really want to see one, uh, find out what it eats. If that if it grows in your area, try to put it in your yard, and they will find it. Um, so um, you know, there's that. All right. So the next guy. Now this is one that can actually sting you. Um, this is a. Uh, it's in the family Saturniidae, which are the things like the Luna moth, another eastern species. This beautiful green thing. Um, some of the large. This is this family is the is one of the the ones that doesn't have mouth parts as adults and couldn't feed even if they wanted to. 
But this one is on uh, Mesquite, and you can see the battery of spines on, on this one. And this one can sting you if you brush up against it. Uh, it'll give sort of a burning sensation. Um, it usually doesn't last very long. There are caterpillars in Brazil, for example, that have very potent stings and have actually people have died from getting stung by them. In North America, we have nothing nearly that strong. Um, and usually you don't even know, it's not like a bee sting where you know right away. You like brush against it and take a few steps and then you'll be like, ow, and you'll look down there might be a little red. It's kind of like a burning sensation, might be a little red mark. If you go back a couple of steps and look where you did what you just brushed into, you might find a, a caterpillar that can sting. So my, my rule of thumb is if it looks like it means business, assume that it does. And then until you find out. So, you know, if you see spines in like groups like that, um, like a pin cushion almost, that's, it's not universal, but that's a pretty good sign it might be able to sting you and you might want to figure out what it is first before you go and touch it. Or alternatively, if you like pain, then just go ahead, yeah, pick the thing up and see what happens. But I try uh, to use pain for its intended purpose of a warning system that something is not quite right. Uh, and so I try to avoid it as much as possible. Here's another caterpillar. Um, this was in, this is, I mean, just to show you um, how, how beautiful um, some of these caterpillars are. And the thing, the thing about caterpillars, the, the, the insects that go through the, the complete metamorphosis, that four stage life cycle, they actually, the, the larvae and the adults are essentially two different animals altogether. And so, you know, if you like moss and, or if you like butterflies, you have a whole nother realm to explore if you start looking at the caterpillars. Because it's, I mean, it's bananas what some of these caterpillars look like and what some of them do. And it's just really a, a matter of going out and you have to, I mean, caterpillars, generally speaking, don't want to be found. So you have to look carefully, walk slowly. Um, Look underneath leaves if you go out during the daytime or, or use a flashlight at night and uh, they're a little bit easier at, at that time typically. Um, and if you don't know what something is, the wonderful, one of the many wonderful things about the internet is you can take pictures and post it on sites like iNaturalist or Bug Guide. And someone who's sitting in Maine might be able to say, oh, that's one of these things. And I have an identity on it. So it's, it's really kind of cool. Um, so again, the caterpillars, they have two jobs, um, eat as much as they can, as quickly as they can, and in the process, not get eaten by something else. That's the list. Then if everything goes okay, they're not found by a predator, they're not found by a parasitoid. Now parasitoids are typically flies and, and wasps. And what they do is they'll lay the, the female wasp or fly will lay their eggs on the caterpillar. And then the, the egg hatches, the larvae of the fly or wasp burrows inside the caterpillar. This is not good just before dinner conversation, but I think it's worth pointing out. And so they'll basically eat the caterpillar from the inside. And then if that happens, typically the caterpillars are in really serious trouble at that point, even though they may not die right away. Um, and then they will, um, the, the fly or the uh, wasp larvae will eventually pupate and then you get more flies or wasps instead of a, another butterfly or moth. And, and those insects are actually very important um, in keeping caterpillar populations in check. Sometimes parasitism rates are 80, 90%, even higher than that. So if you see a butterfly or a moth flying around, they're the lucky ones because they actually survived all the way to adulthood. But to get to adulthood from the caterpillar, you have to go through the pupation. And this is uh, a silk moth, same family as the, um, as the uh, tricolor buck moth, um, which are uh, the Saturnians, the wild uh, silk moth, big moths typically. And this one, basically, you can see the silk wrapped in a little bit of leaf fragments in there to kind of give it a little bit of camouflage. But there is the, if you were to take a very sharp knife and sort of slit through this, not that I recommend anyone do this, but you would see the pupa inside. And so here's another pupa. So you actually see what the pupa looks like. This is of a white line sphinx moth, one of our more common sphinx moths in Southern Arizona. And they're actually probably the most common sphinx moth in all of North America is this white lined one. And so the pupa, when I was a kid, um, you know, and I remember in school where they would say, the teachers would say that the pupa is the resting stage. 
between the, the caterpillar stage and the adult. And it's almost as if they got so tired after eating all that food as the caterpillar, they needed to take a break. And that is not the case. Um, that what's basically going on inside of this exoskeleton that we can't sort of see is the worm-like caterpillar body is completely broken down and reorganized into the adult. And to me, that is a miracle. Um, I'm not religious. We hear the word miracle a lot. Um, this is a miracle to me. Um, and every, so not only butterflies and moths go through this, but beetles, um, bees, wasps, and ants, um, true flies like uh, robber flies and things like that, the, the higher or more advanced insects, they all go through this stage. And to call it a uh, resting stage greatly um, un underappreciates what's actually going on. It's actually phenomenal. It's all under um, control of typically um, hormones. It's chemically, in, uh, chemically mediated. And so you know, it's kind of this, this sort of soupy stuff inside there. And then again, if everything goes okay, then you get the adult that comes out and that's what flies around and you get to see more often. Um, sphinx moths, many of them, most of them actually pupate in the ground. Um, and so they make the, the, the caterpillar digs down and makes this little cell in the cell and underground and that's where they pupate. So uh, typically, they're not um, above the, the, the ground. They're a little bit harder to spot, whereas the previous slide, Glover's silk moth, they're up on branches and things with a careful eye. You can find them. But again, insects, I think it, it really does help to go through um, the process. To go, if you want to find them, it, it's going to require patience. It's going to require persistence. But um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating aspect of these animals' biology that I think a lot of times gets sort of uh, overlooked. All right, so now we go to the classification. This is how many species are in the order Lepidoptera. So the numbers vary a little bit. I think, I think most people nowadays uh, suggest that there's about 160, 165,000 species of, of Lepidoptera. So that's both butterflies and moths um, in the world with many, many, many more waiting to be described to science. So the true number of actually species in this order is probably at least 100,000 under these numbers. Um, it just takes, I mean, people just need to go out and find them and describe them. And that's, that's not a lot of fun. It's very tedious work. A lot of people, I know of people who have undescribed spe uh, species sitting in, in their in their labs that they just haven't written up because it's kind of like uh, an academic root canal in a way. It's not pleasant. Uh, very, very detailed oriented. You can go online and, and you can read some of them. And if you have insomnia, that's, you might cure it by reading some new species descriptions pretty quickly. But in North America, there's about 13,000 species uh, in the order Lepidoptera and 94% of them are moths. So what that tells us is there is a lot more butterfly or moss than butterflies. Um, in Western North America, there's 8,000 species roughly. That number is surely an underestimate. Um, and about 2,000 of those occur in Southern Arizona alone. Um, so we have uh, in the Southern, especially the Southeastern quadrant of the state because we have the mountains and the, the, the influence of the Sierra Madre Occidental from Mexico. Um, it's, it's, remarkably diverse. One of the most diverse regions in North America is where we are. And historically, they've often, uh, the order Lepidoptera has often been divided into micro Lepidoptera and macro Lepidoptera or micros and macros. Obviously, um, Greg, we're going to get to that. Your, your very good question. Greg asked, does that mean that butterflies evolved from moss? We're going to get to that on the very next slide. Um, so even though there's an implied, or not even implied, a very obvious size factor related in those names, um, it's, it's many of the micros are obviously small, but there are macro or micros that are bigger than many of the macros. So it's actually more based on evolution than size. The micros tend to have evolved earlier, or they're a lower branch in the Lepidoptera family tree and the macros came on the scene later. So I have a couple of slides here. This one, 
This one will be on the quiz. Um, so, you, you know, take quick notes, Spell, spelling does count. Uh, this is a mess actually. So this is the family tree of all the Lepidoptera. Um, the top of the screen is the micros, the bottom of the screen is the macros. Where the macros start is if you go about halfway, you'll see a thick black bar that says pyraloidea, P-Y-R-A-L-O-I-D-E-A. Everything from that to the bottom are the macros. Everything from the, the name above that to the top are all the micros. And the thickness of the bars determines how many species there, there are. So you get some pretty speciose groups. If you go down a few names from that Pyraloidy about the middle of the screen, you'll see something that says Hesp and then Papillionoidea. That is the butterflies. So I'll, I don't want, this will, this will give you a headache if you look, look at it long enough. Um, but here's a more simplified version of that. So again, your micros are at the top, your macros at the bottom. If you look just below center, you see all those blue icons, those are the butterflies. And notice there's moss above them and there's moss below them. We should look at butterflies, or at least we could make the argument that you could look at butterflies as generally brightly colored diurnal moss, and that would be correct. They are not a specific, they're not like at the very top of the tree, they're not at the very bottom. They're what, what uh, evolutionary biologists say, they're nested right in amongst the moths. So if they're basically a, a lineage that has decided that um, they like it during the daytime more. I mean, it wasn't, they didn't decide, that's just the way the evolution went. But um, they are not that different from moss and moss around them on all sides. So yes, uh, butterflies, without a doubt, no question about it, did evolve from moss. And we, we as a species, we tend to look at butterflies very differently than we look at moss. Um, you know, butterflies, many of them, most of them are brightly colored. They fly during the daytime when most of us are active. Um, there are not many pests in the butterfly group. Um, Moths are, are usually, you know, the opposite. They fly during the evening. We, you know, back from the day when we lived in caves, we, we retreated from the darkness. Moths embrace it. Um, some fly during the daytime, but most do not. Uh, many of them are relatively drab in comparison to some butterflies. Some of the caterpillars are indeed pests. And so even though they're really from a biological sense, they're not that different. We, uh, we as a species do have very different impressions of both groups, although it is changing. Um, moths are get, starting to get more, more love than they have in the past. So we're going to go quickly through some of the micros. So they're often, obviously not surprising, they're often small to tiny in size. When I say tiny, you know, they might be a, an eighth of an inch long, couple millimeters long, uh, three, four millimeters, something like that. Um, but many of them are quite large. So again, it don't, don't, hang, don't spend too much time with micros and mac macros. In fact, a lot of entomologists don't like those terms anymore because it sort of oversimplifies the, the relationship. So you might want to call them more ancient or earlier evolved or something along those lines. And that, that takes the size question and all of its exceptions out of the, the equation. But it also um, keeps that the, they are a little bit of a different group um, uh, than the one, the, the macro. So um, in other words, you sometimes you hear them called primitive. I don't particularly like that word in it because a, a, a lot of people generally think that word sort of means that they're somewhat less evolved or less capable. That's not the case. So that's why I, I like other words that actually get the point across and also are truthful. So ancient or earlier or something like that. Um, they're very, very diverse in terms of their lifestyle and number of species. The true, you know, many of those those species that have yet to be described, uh, many of those are in this group. And that's because there's many of them are small. They're not easy animals to study. Um, some of them are beautiful or strikingly patterned, but um, the people who study, there's usually a subgroup 
of moth people that um, study the micros. There's not all that, I mean, there are people who study both mac micros and macros, but a lot of people, if you're a micro person, you spend a lot of time underneath a microscope. And these, and, and as a result of their size and their, and their, at least their perceived difficulty in identifying them, the micros tend to get understudied relative to the butterflies and the macro moths. Um, Virginia asked a question, aren't moths super pollinators? Um, moths are very good pollinators. It kind of varies amongst all the different groups. Sphinx, moth Sphinx, Sphinx moths are very, very important pollinators, especially in the tropics. Um, they're also pollinators of like sacred datura, uh, a local plant here, as well as uh, agaves and some other plants. So it varies across the broad spectrum. Remember, there's 160 thousand plus variations on the theme uh, and some of them again have no mouth, mouth parts so they couldn't pollinate even if they wanted to but yes many moths are important pollinators so here's one this is uh, a, 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 um, a small moth that you know so the wingspan on this guy is probably about an inch from the four wing tip across to the other four wing tip not the most brightly colored thing but it's one of those if you have a black light sheet out, um, it would draw your attention just because of the striking patterns on it. Um, as with this one, this was actually the same night um, that the other one was on. Um, and so um, there's another species looks a lot like this, doesn't have quite as much orange on it as, the, as this one does. Uh, but again, um, I think these are beautiful little creatures. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wanted to get the point across that not all micros are really, really tiny and they're not all kind of gray and hard to identify. Some of them are actually pretty beautiful and, and pretty easy to identify. So the mesquite stinger moth, now this is another one. This it belongs to a, a family called the flannel moth family. Um, and it's not called, they don't call that because they listen to like grunge rock or anything and all walk around like Nirvana t-shirts and the flannel shirt over it. Speak. I don't know where the name, name comes from, to be honest with you, but this is another, um, I haven't seen any yet. It's getting to be their time. If you have mesquite in your yard or in your neighborhood, you will have these adults showing up at your lights soon. Um, my guess is that um, it, it's probably delayed a little bit, at least because of the lack of rain, um, but you will see them. And when I say, you know, they're common at lights, you might have 10 or 12 of them at a light on any given night at the same time. And this thing's again about an inch from the top of the head to the tip of the wings. It's a pretty, you know, it's kind of a, a dark gray and white moth with a lot of hair like scales on, on the thorax to make it look hairy. Um, pretty easy moth to recognize, but um, it's, it's caterpillars feed on more than mesquite. They'll also feed on things like uh, Palo Verde, for example. Um, and so this is another one the caterpillars could sting you. The yucca moth, a really fantastic um, uh, moth. They're in the family Prodoxidae. And yuccas are pollinated only by yucca moths. And um, many of the yucca moths are particular to one species of yucca plant. So this is the all your eggs in one basket sort of strategy for both the plant and the animal. So what happens is the females, this is, I'm actually looking inside of a banana, I'm sorry, soap tree yucca flower during the daytime. She's in the flower and she has modified mouth parts that they call tentacles. And basically what she does is she makes a ball of pollen and then she, from a yucca flower. And then she flies to another yucca plant and she sort of slam dunks that yucca pollen ball onto the stigma, which is the pollen receiving part of the female part of the flower and voila you have the, your yuccas pollinated so that works out great for the plant but what does the moth get out of it so the moth will then lay the eggs on um, the developing um, on the on the ovary of the flower and then as the the fruit start to mature um, the yucca moth caterpillars actually feed on some of the seeds inside the yucca fruit so by pollinating the, the plant, the yucca benefits, the yucca moth benefits by getting some food for its, her babies off the pollinated yucca plant. So it's a very tight relationship. Um, and you know, relationships such as these are, are um, really worth con conservation 
because if you lose one, you're going to eventually lose the other because that, they, they've specialized so much, they need each other both. Um, plume moss, these things, they're very easy to recognize as such because they're kind of, they form this letter T shape on them. And they are fairly, they, so most moss, not every single moth, but most moss have two pairs of wings on each side of the body. On the plume moss, when they're at rest, they kind of roll them all together. So it looks like they only have one wing on each side of the body. Um, they're kind of a difficult group to, well, they're easy to recognize as a family, but difficult oftentimes to identify them to the species level. Um, you often have to look at them under a microscope. Um, that Anyway, so uh, these are, are, are widespread. They're very common. Um, they all have a very thin, attenuated shape to them, easy to recognize as a, as a group. Um, this belong, so this is a, a wasp mimic. The, the family this guy belongs to is the Cessiidae, and they are called the clear wing moss. Many of them are like wasp mimics. Um, they fly during the daytime, uh, they'll visit flowers, and some of them are spot on mimics for wasps, meaning that you wouldn't want to touch them because you, your brain says, don't touch them, you're going to get stung. Um, but if you see a, a, an animal sticking its, its tongue, like its straw into a flower, you know you're looking at a moth because wasps have chewing mouth parts. So that's one way to tell. Um, or if you grab it, it stings you. It's not a moth. That's another way to tell. Um, that's a little bit more problematic probably, but you can do it that way. Um, so this one, um, the name it is pretty, a, a pretty glorious moth actually, but um, they... Uh, their caterpillars feed on members of the cucurbitaceae, which is the squash, cucumber, melon family. And occasionally they can become pests. Um, and they don't, this is a group that, that does not, it's not that surprising really, because they tend to fly during the daytime, but they don't come to lights uh, typically. Um, so um, this is one, if you do decide to put up a black light sheet at some point, and we can talk about that at the end, um, don't expect many of these guys to show up because they normally don't. All right, so the macros, again, more recently evolved near the bottom of the page on those two slides that showed the family tree. Um, the two largest groups in the order, the entire order are here, the geometridae, which are the inchworms or loopers. Um, those are named, uh, named both after the caterpillars. The adults are often called like inchworm moths. Uh, and then you have what used to be one family has been just split into actually three or four now. Um, so that Noctuidae plus the Eribidae, that, that formerly had about 30,000 species in it by itself. And to give you a frame of reference, there's 10,000 species of bird in the world. This is 30,000 species in what was one time one family of moss. So again, and then an illustration of how many moths are out there. But more recent um, genetic evidence suggests that what we thought was one family is, is actually more than that, at least according to some people, so the numbers are, are down a little bit. Um, unlike the mice, so the, mice, the ones I mentioned that feed like on uh, fungi and, and animal fibers and predators, many of those are in the micro group. The macros tend to be most of your typical foliage eaters. Some will feed on flowers. Um, there's not as much variation in terms of lifestyle in the macro lepidoptera, but they are more diverse in terms of number of species in this group. So here's one, this guy, uh, this came to the, to the, turned the patio light on and they, they show up sometimes. Um, I love the little hair, what's called hair pencils on the tip of the abdomen there, kind of orange and gray with black spots on them. Give you a frame of reference. This is guys again, about an inch from across the wingspan. And they're in the family Crambidae, which is a, um, uh, a, the, the basal or the, the most, ancient of the macro moss, but they're also very, many of them are very, very colorful. Um, this is one, this next guy is going to be one of my favorites. Um, I, this guy, I don't know, it's only gray, white, and black, but it does it in a pretty spectacular fashion. Got the long hair, it's got the long hairy legs. His wings are relatively short because you can see the abdomen stick out uh, past the, the wingtips. He's got that sort of mohawk on his thorax there with those long black scales sticking up. Um, these are in the family, the Lazeocampidae, which includes like the tent caterpillar moss. And um, this one, many of our moss have like one, 
generation per year. This one has multiple ones. I actually started seeing these guys at lights this year in February. Um, and you'll see them into September, maybe even October. Um, what, the, what they do, they're pretty lazy moths, though. They'll fly in and they'll go, this was the next day. And sometimes they'll actually stay, like, over the next night, too, without moving. Um, then they eventually fly off. Uh, again, not the most brightly colored thing. I just think it's a really striking pattern. They're one of my favorites. Um, and like I said, they are usually pretty common. So here's one of our Sphinx moths. This is, we showed, I, I mentioned earlier that the, we showed the pupa of the white line Sphinx moth. If everything goes good, this is what that pupa will turn into. Um, as you can see, it's visiting a thistle flower during the daytime. Um, there, are, there are several species of Sphinx moth that fly during the daytime, um, including this one. Um, and some of them are very good wasp or bee mimics. Um, most of those are not in Arizona, but there are a couple of species. Um, sphinx moths are pretty easy to recognize because they kind of have a thick body that tapers sort of to a point and they have very elongated forewings. Uh, the, the front pair of wings are like, almost like when they were wet, they got stretched out to make them kind of longer, much longer than the hind wings are. Um, if you turn your lights on, uh, patio lights on, um, I was seeing these actually, I have not seen any in a while. Um, I've seen caterpillars, so the next generation's on the way. But I haven't seen any adults in, at least at my lights, uh, in, in, a, in a few few weeks. And so my guess is that, again, it's the local year and they're just not as abundant because they have the ability as pupa to, to stay uh, up to several years, actually, in some cases as a pupa until conditions are better. And the fact that we've been hotter than normal and drier than normal, right now we're on pace to be the fourth worst monsoon on record. Um, which is not good, but um, my guess that the, 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 the weather is, is playing a part in this. Another sphinx moth, I just had one yesterday, the rustic sphinx, a big black and white moth. Um, when I say big, the body on this guy is probably three inches long if you, if you pulled his wings all the way out, so they were like straight across his, uh, like a, ver a horizontal line. It's more like four inches. So these guys are, when these show up, you'll definitely notice them. And to give you a size reference, to the, that moth to the right is one of those crambid moths. And so um, obviously much smaller. And if you're a, 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 but a moth person, you set up lights. When one of the big ones shows up, you usually know because the whole sheet will move. Um, and then it's like, whoa, we got something good. Um, not that they're all not good. Another one, the pink spotted hawk moth. This one, this one's around too. Um, this one's easy to identify because it's the only uh, sphinx moth in North America that's got the pink spots on the sides of the abdomen. So this would be a good one to start with. Um, and they're kind of more brown on the wings. This genus is pretty closely related to uh, the genus Manduca, which is the one that the rustic sphinx and the um, Carolina sphinx and five spotted sphinx are in. This one just tends to have a, a lot more brownish tones to it and then the pink spots on the side. About the same size as a rustic sphinx. Again, pretty big moth. Any of, so if you have flowers in your yard that attract butterflies during the daytime, they're very likely attracting, um, they're very likely attracting moths at night. So another way you could find them um, um, is to, is to look, you know, go out the flashlight, those flowers at night and see if you can find them. Um, yes, Greg, you, we, have, we have the snowberry clear wing, which is a sphinx that, that mimics a, um, a, a, a wasp or a bee, but there's more of that, more different, like Nessus sphinx and things like that are, tend to be more southeastern and eastern than in the west. Um, that's our cross to bear, I guess. Um, so that one that was the size of a hot dog bun, the caterpillar, this is what it will turn into. Uh, these guys, again, have a wingspan of probably four inches or so. Um, again, this group, the next couple of slides are going to be the, um, uh, the, the Saturnius. They do not have mouth parts as adults. They cannot feed, no matter how hungry they get, they can't do anything about it. So this is the one the caterpillars feed on wild cotton. If you, uh, among other plants, that's the most frequently used host here. If you want to find the moth or the butterfly for that matter, you need to go at the time of year when the adults are flying, they're not all flying all year long, um, and 
go where you find the plant that the caterpillars feed on. If you do those two things, you have a pretty good chance of finding your quarry. Uh, Western imperial moth, very similar to an Eastern species, um, uh, almost, almost identical. So this is, again, same group. So as the adults, without any mouth parts, if they were to die a natural death without getting eaten by a predator or flying into a car or something like that, we're looking at a, a lifespan of about a week as an adult. The entire lifespan from egg to natural death as an adult is, is closer to a year altogether. Um, but the adults in this, in this particular family can only typically only live about um, a few couple days to about a week or so, maybe a little bit longer than that if they're really lucky, but they don't live very long. So this is when this was in Madeira Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains. And this is one of those moths, again, about the same size as the last one. When they show up, the whole sheet kind of moves. And if you're a mother, which by the way is spelled the same way as mother, um, you you tip we typically kind of get excited when something like that happens, like, oh, something impressive just flew in. Another one you could get at your yard, you know, if you're living around Tucson. Again, if you have mesquite trees, this guy feeds on mesquites as a caterpillar. And their caterpillars are fantastic. This guy will sit there. Normally the wings are closed, so you can't see that red. Um, and so he looks basically black, flecked very finely with black and white. He's got the white spot and he's got the black lines on them. But by, by and large, he's going to look black. And he'll just sit there. He, he sort of has his wings like a tent uh, over the body. And you'll see that what I mean in the next slide, what I mean by a tent. Um, and then they're trying really hard not to be seen. But if someone were to come up um, and touch it, then it might... Um, Open those, open those four wings to show those hind wings. It has like an eye spot there, and it's got that warning coloration, and that might be enough to startle a predator. Um, and so normally, if you see them, those wings are folded up. You don't see the red. Uh, but this is a very common, um, the most. It's the most common uh, silk moth in the valleys of southern Arizona. And if you have mesquite plants around, you have this guy. The tricolor buck moth, this is a day flying moth um, that, um, this is what I mean by tent like, the, the wings kind of come up and the body is right in the middle. You can't know, think of like a pup tent, that's sort of what the body, what the resting posture is. Um, if you, in, in November, you can often find some of the buck moths. If you ever go to Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge in November, early November, um, buck moths are all over the place flying around, uh, but they're looking for mates. Remember, these guys can't feed either. The same family as um, the other one. This is um, also the, the caterpillar I showed that might sting. It's, this, this is what it will turn into. Here's another one, the Nevada buck moth. This is the one that's really common in Buenos Aires, actually. Um, they're all over the place, um, and you can see the red they, they are often warningly colored, um, although it's not real obvious. You often, uh, sometimes the bands on the, on the abdomen are that color. Um, but again, warning potential predators that I might mean business or I might just be fooling around. I might be bluffing you, who knows. Um, the Oculea moth, another Western counterpart for an Eastern species. Uh, this is even bigger. This guy's got a wingspan of closer to four and a half to five inches, so pretty big. If you look at the hind wings there, it looks like two eyes and a mustache looking at you. And here you can see what I mean, those big feathery antennae that they use to get those pheromones. Um, they actually have recorded, uh, they did an experiment with a silk moth that lives in Asia. And they, um, it, it came, it found a calling female from seven miles away, which is pretty impressive in the dark. Um, most distances are usually like a mile or less, but they, you know, that doesn't mean that they can't, at least on occasion, go much further to find a female. Um, the Glover silk moth, this is another one that's pretty common in our mountains around here. You can see, again, those big feathery antennae sticking up, kind of like, again, like a satellite dish. Okay, so the last few that haven't been able to feed as adults. Now we're going to get into some that can feed as adults. Um, so the geometers, the inchworm family, those, they're, they're, some of them are quite colorful, but many of them are very cryptic, meaning if this guy was sitting on a tree trunk and not on a wall, he's going to blend in very, very well. Um, this is, if you turn on your lights, your patio lights, if you're anywhere in southern Arizona, 
you'll get these guys eventually. They're quite common. Wingspan, we're probably looking at two inch and three quarters to two inches across the, the four wings. Um, one of the moths that actually rests like a butterfly is in this family too. So if you have a, a black light up and you see something fly in and it rests, most of the butterflies rest with their wings folded like that. Um, if you see something at night, it's very likely to be one of the geometer moths and not a butterfly. Um, and these guys are actually quite common as well. They have that really sort of, you know, orangey brown background color with the white spots and bands on them. There's another member of this genus that occurs in southern Arizona. The two look pretty similar to each other, but easy to recognize them. That's a pretty good look at the antennae on these guys as well. If you see a green moth, um, it's likely it's in this group. Uh, many of these, the, the specific, specific group called emeralds, are these beautiful pastel greens and they have white lines on them. And some of them have red spots on the body where that white stripe is. And, and they're just really delicate. I mean, they can be pretty small. This guy's wingspan is probably three quarters of an inch. Um, they're not real, real big, um, but they're, they're, they're beautiful, delicately beautiful um, little little moss. And we have several species um, that are emeralds in Southern Arizona. The areta, this one is the most common one by far. Then we get to the noctuids, that really big family. Um, so uh, the one on the left, Spragia magnifica, it is smaller than some of the micros that I showed um, earlier. This, the body length on this thing is probably half an inch. The one on the right, the hieroglyphic moth, that's basically uh, almost a tropical moth that makes it into the southern tier of states. It can go, it sometimes wanders much further north than that. Um, it's significantly bigger. The, the, the hieroglyphic moth is probably an inch in body length, but very, both of them are very distinctively patterned and would be difficult to, I think, to confuse with something else. But, you know, the, the, the spray the, the, the the thing with that is just to see it in the first place because they are quite small, but it's, a, it's an example of good things come in small packages, I think. This guy is another day flying moth. Um, this is, if you've ever been to the Huachuca Mountains this time of year, uh, these things are everywhere. This was actually at um, mud. So uh, a lot of butterflies, some moths will go to mud because not because of the mud itself, but the mud has, the water has dissolved minerals in the soil that they can, you know, if it's in uh, moist enough, they can slurp that up. And they, they often, you'll often see them there. They call them puddle parties sometimes. But some years, this, this thing can be absolutely everywhere. When I say everywhere, literally, you know, a thousand of them within maybe 200, 300 foot walk from where you started. Uh, but every year is different. Um, this one's got those thread-like antennae, by the way. This guy, um, it feeds on uh, staghorn, and staghorn and other choyas as caterpillars. Um, you normally see it with the wings shut, so you don't see those bright orange hind wings. Um, they'll come into sheets, and sometimes when they first come into sheets, before they settle down, you get pretty good looks at the hind wings, and so that's what this, this one had done. Um, but again, it's kind of like a, a brassy look to the margins of that white stripe. And so if you have this one, if you have staghorn choya for sure, many other choyas are also likely you probably have, if you have that stuff in your yard or neighborhood, you'll have this moth. Um, they, they go hand in hand. Another day flying moth is the veined tanuka. That C is silent. I don't even know why it's in there. Uh, that's what the name is. But this is another one of those tiger moths. We've got a bright orange head. Uh, blue and purple reflections on the wings with uh, the paler veins on them. Um, this one will often come to flowers during the daytime. It also shows up at lights at night. I don't know when they sleep because it seems like they're active all the time. Um, body length on this, probably about an inch. Uh, not, the, not counting the antenna, just counting the head to the tip of the wing. Um, and they're very widespread. By far the most common of the Tanukas in Southern Arizona is this guy. They replace it a sim by a similar species at higher elevations. Um, and look for them, like I said, uh, things like desert broom and rabbit brush, which are, haven't started to flower yet, but they will in the next few weeks. Um, those are really good nectar attractants. And you'll often see a bunch of these things around those flowers. 
one of the more spectacular um, tiger moths, actually the largest tiger moth in uh, North America is this thing. Um, it's, it's pretty white. This is a male because you can see all the white on the hind wing. Females replace that white with orange. So they're even more spectacular. Um, I don't have any idea where the flag part of the name comes from, but um, they are pretty darn spectacular um, moss. And wingspan on these guys is more like maybe three inches. So they're, they're significantly bigger than like the one, the slide that was before that. So um, that's that. That. This is Andrea Herr again. Um, I'm going to post uh, the link to the Arizona Master Naturalist Organization in the chat, and we really would love it if you guys went out and took a look at all the good work that we're doing.